about how Warren Buffett can tell the difference between a company with a competitive advantage and a company that's a losing proposition? Warren scrutinizes their financial statements. In part two of our three-part series, we will teach you how Warren Buffett dissects the balance sheet and the statement of cash flows. If you watch part one and two, you will be equipped to read the income statement, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flows, just like Warren Buffett. But if you haven't seen part one, I suggest you head on over there and watch it first. This three-part series is a summary of Warren Buffett and the interpretation of financial statements by Mary Buffett and David Clark. Welcome to Girl Investors. I am the founder and creator of Girl Investors. We are on a mission to improve financial literacy and an investing mindset among women of all ages. So if this sounds good to you, then please keep watching. One of the things you will find, which is interesting and people don't think of it enough, with most businesses and with most individuals, is life tends to snap you at your weakest link. The two biggest weakest links in my experience, I've seen more people fail because of liquor and leverage. Leverage being borrowed money. Warren Buffett. The balance sheet shows a company's resources, which are its assets, and how those resources were funded, meaning in terms of liabilities and shareholders' equity, on a particular date, usually the end of the year. Think of this balance sheet like a point estimate or a snapshot of a point in time. There is this famous accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus shareholders' equity. Because each side needs to balance, hence the name. <laughs> this is why we do double entry accounting when developing a balance sheet. The authors didn't review that in the book, so I will leave it out, but we can review it in future videos. Let's start with the simplified balance sheet. There are many different kinds of assets, which are divided into current assets, which means it can be converted into cash within one year, and non-current assets, greater than one year. Current assets can be turned into cash quite easily and are things like cash and marketable securities, accounts receivable, inventories, and prepaid expenses. These are listed on the balance sheet in order of liquidity from highest liquidity to least. Current assets are also known as working assets because it illustrates the cash, inventories, accounts receivable, cash cycle. Look for companies where the inventory and cash are increasing together. Cash or cash equivalents such as three-month treasuries or short-term cash deposits are highly liquid assets. Lots of cash can mean the company is generating cash through its business or that it recently sold a business unit or bonds. Notice this difference. Warren tries to gauge the actual source of the cash. Long-term or non-current assets cannot be converted into cash during the year. These are things like long-term investments, property, plant, and equipment, intangible assets, and goodwill. Non-physical assets such as patents, trademarks, and goodwill acquired by the company that have value based on the rights belonging to that company. We will discuss this further on. An important thing to note is that most balance sheet items are listed at their historical or acquisition cost. This is also known as book value. Book value is a term that you will hear often, so I suggest that you become familiar with it. This prevents assets from being overstated and is an example of conservatism. As an FYI, li liabilities can also be stated as current and non-current liabilities. So a current liability would be any amount that's due to be paid to a creditor in less than one year, and a non-current liability is any obligation that's not due to be repaid within the year. Cash is king. Cash or cash equivalents, such as three-month treasuries or a short-term cash deposit, are highly liquid assets. So as we alluded to previously, loss of cash can mean that the company is generating cash through its business or that it recently sold a business unit or sold bonds. Companies can then use excess cash to expand its business operations, acquire new companies, invest in shares of other companies, buy back their stock, or pay cash dividends to its shareholders. They could even save it if they wanted to. The three basic ways of creating a large stockpile of cash are, one, to sell new corporate bonds or issue equity to the public, two, to sell an existing business or asset, or three, generate excess cash through its ongoing business. So when Warren analyzes a business with excess cash with little debt, he bets that the company can withstand short-term troubles, but only if he sees it generating cash through its ongoing business operations. In investing and accounting, we tend to use ratios quite frequently. The current and quick ratios gauge the ability of a company to cover short-term financing needs. The current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities. A rough rule of thumb is that a current ratio of greater than one is considered good. Greater than one implies that there are more liquid assets than short-term liabilities, reflecting a healthier level of liquidity. However, be aware that many companies with a durable competitive advantage do have current ratios less than one. The reason for this is because of their excellent earning power, so they can pay their shareholders dividends or they can buy back their stocks, which could lower their cash reserves temporarily and decrease their current ratio. CEOs can be criticized for buying back stock. Property, plant, and equipment. Warren is not a fan of property, plant, and equipment, or PP&E. Any new purchases of PP&E are capital expenditures that decrease cash. PP&E represents land, buildings, and machinery used in the manufacturing in the company's products and services, plus all the costs associated, such as the transportation, installation, and so forth, that are necessary to prepare those fixed assets for the service. PP&E cycles out of the balance sheet and into the income statement as depreciation. Remember our discussion about depreciation? Take a moment to review part one if you have forgotten it. The link is in the description box. When a company does not have a long-term competitive advantage, it usually has to make capital expenditures to stay competitive in its industry, and very often they have to access debt financing, meaning getting loans to pay for it. One of the ways a company can grow is by acquiring other companies or products. 
Goodwill is the amount by which the purchase price for a company exceeds its fair market value. Why would you pay more than fair market value? Well, companies acquire another company or product, then there is an intangible value that's built into the price. This can be from the acquired company's business name, customer relations, employee morale, and product potential. Although these are intangible, they do have some monetary value. And once you start reading financial statements, you'll see that companies that acquire other companies, Goodwill can actually become quite a sizable asset on the balance sheet. Take note though, Goodwill is only created if the purchase price exceeds the book value of all the assets acquired. And sometimes, if the value of a previously acquired company declines, Goodwill is actually recorded as an impairment charge on the balance sheet. Goodwill write-downs imply that a company overpaid in the original acquisition. Raise your hand if you like the idea of overpaying for something. I hope no one raised their hands. I definitely do not like to overpay for something, and I'm not pleased to know if a company I invested in overpaid as well. All right, let's do an example. Gilead, the pharmaceutical company, acquired another company, Pharmaset, in 2011 for 11 billion US dollars. That's a lot of zeros after the 11. The book value for Pharmaset was actually 172 million in 2011. The negotiator that Pharmacest argued that because of the market potential of sofosfavir, which was their lead molecule in treating hepatitis C, that Pharmacet's fair market value is probably higher than 172 million. What they were saying is that there was no way that they were going to sell their company for 172 million. Therefore, they actually ended up selling their company to Gilead for a cool 11 billion US dollars, 10.28 billion above its book value. Not too shabby if you ask me. The 10.828 billion paid above the, above the book value, which was 172 million, was recorded as goodwill on Gilead's balance sheet. Hey, by the way, if you're enjoying this video and learning something, please click the like button. This will help us so much. Intangible assets. Intangible assets are non-physical things of value. Remember, the asset must be acquired and not developed in-house. Types of intangible assets include customer lists, franchises, memberships, licenses, patents and technology, trademarks, and goodwill. Intangible assets are reduced on the balance sheet via an amortization expense on the income statement. Coca-Cola's brand is worth billions, but it's not recorded on the balance sheet because it was internally developed. Companies with a durable competitive advantage often have their greatest asset absent from their balance sheet. Return on total assets. How does Warren ensure the company is putting its assets to efficient use? He calculates the return on total assets. The return on total assets is simply net earnings divided by total assets. At the time of this book, Coca-Cola had $43 billion in assets and a return on total assets of 12%. Moody's, the credit rating agency, had $1.7 billion in assets and a return on total assets of 43%. You might be thinking that it's probably easier to raise $1.7 billion to acquire Moody's than the $43 billion to acquire Coca-Cola. And in terms of dollars, it is. Warren weighs the risks and benefits of this though, because it's relatively affordable, the durability of Moody's competitive advantage is actually much weaker than Coca-Cola's. More buyers could bid for Moody's than Coca-Cola because of the price point. The accounting equation. To put it simply, liabilities and shareholders' equity represent the company's sources of funds, meaning how it pays for its assets. Liabilities represent what the company owes to others. They must be measurable. Their occurrence is probable. Equity represents sources of funds through equity investment or retained earnings, which is what the company has earned and kept through its business operations. Current liabilities include things like accounts payable, accrued expenses, for example, employee salaries, short-term debt, which is due in 12 months, and deferred revenues. Long-term or non-current liabilities include long-term debt or capital leases. Long-term debt is simply debt whose maturity exceeds 12 months or one year. Shareholders or owner's equity includes preferred stock, common stock, and treasury stock, and retained earnings, and other comprehensive income that include gains and losses from foreign currency translations, or unrealized gains or losses on available for sale securities, etc. Remember that the equation must balance. This means that any change in assets is accompanied by an offsetting change in either liabilities or shareholders' equity. This keeps the balance sheet, well, in balance. Short-term debt versus long-term debt. On the balance sheet, liabilities are presented in order of when they are to be paid. Current liabilities, such as short-term debt and accounts payable, are to be paid within one year. Any portion of long-term debt due within one year is also listed under the short-term debt line item. Long-term liabilities, such as long-term debt, are not due within the year and is often a sizable liability. Warren carefully scrutinizes how much short-term debt and long-term debt a company has, as should you. Who likes to be saddled with debt? He shies away from companies with a higher short-term to long-term debt ratio. Companies with a durable competitive advantage require little to no long-term debt. They are self-financing from their business operations. Warren reviews how much long-term debt load they've had in the past 10 years. Companies with a durable competitive advantage have enough earnings to pay off all their long-term debt in three to four years. And in case you haven't figured this out, Warren has extremely high standards. The minority interest. A minority interest is ownership of or interest of less than 50% of an enterprise. The term can refer to either stock ownership or a partnership interest in a company. Minority interests are the portion of a company or stock that are not held by the parent company. Most minority interests range between 20 and 30% and show up as a liability on the balance sheet. Although this line item doesn't help much with identifying a company with a durable competitive advantage, it's still important to know what this term means. Solvency ratios. Factor ratios. 
the solvency ratio. Solvency ratios are measures of a firm's ability to repay its debt obligations. The debt to equity ratio helps to identify whether a company is using debt to finance its operations. The debt to equity ratio is total liabilities divided by shareholders' equity. So we would want to see a company with high shareholders' equity and low total liabilities. But sometimes this ratio can be a bit misleading. For example, a company with a durable competitive advantage could be buying back its stock, effectively lowering shareholders' equity and decreasing the debt to equity ratio. Warren prefers to add back any treasury stock that the company acquired through stock buybacks before calculating this ratio. A company with a debt to equity ratio of 0.65 means that for every dollar of equity, the company has 65 cents of debt. Likewise, a company with a debt to equity ratio of 38 means that for every dollar of equity, the company has $38 of debt. Which one seems better to you? Shareholders equity. Rearranging the accounting equation, assets minus liabilities equals shareholders equity. Equity represents the sources of funds through either equity investments or retained earnings. Equity investments could be preferred stock, common stock, or treasury stocks, and the retained earnings are, if you don't know what any of this means, just please keep watching. Preferred stock. First, you have preferred stock. Preferred stock are stock that have special rights to a dividend that takes priority over common stock owners, but they do not have voting rights. Companies with a durable competitive advantage do not tend to have preferred stock because they have little debt, meaning they are self-financing, meaning they didn't need to issue equity because they are earning favorable returns from their business operations. Also, dividends that are paid out are not tax deductible, like interest on debt, which is really just makes it expensive money. Look at it this way. Most businesses don't issue dividends because these are viewed as debt with a tax disadvantage, and dividends do not reduce taxable income. So although shareholders might love receiving dividends, it really might not be the smartest way to allocate company resources. Common stock. Then you have common stock. Common stock represents capital received by a company when it issues shares. This allows for participation in the profits of the company in the form of a dividend. It also represents ownership and voting rights. One vote for every share held. If the company is dissolved, any residual amounts left over after everyone else is paid would then go to the common shareholders. Treasury stock. Next comes treasury stock. This is when a company buys back its common stock. The company can either cancel them or it can hold onto it with the possibility of reissuing them later on, which is what we call treasury stock. Companies that have a durable competitive advantage have treasury stock or have bought back their shares. One little caveat here is that it's not necessarily responsible for a company to overspend or take on debt to buy back their shares. Also, some degree of cash reserves are important for a rainy day. Therefore, I don't think the idea of share buybacks is necessarily black and white. Retained earnings. And finally, retained earnings. The company's net earnings can either be retained, meaning it's saved, or they can use it to pay out dividends or to buy back shares. Surprise, surprise, Warren Buffett retains 100% of Berkshire Hathaway's net earnings. Yeah! A company's retained earnings is an accumulated number from all prior years. If a company is not adding to its retained earnings, it's not growing its net worth. Let me repeat, if a company is not adding to its retained earnings, it is not growing its net worth. The rate of growth of a company's retained earnings is a good indicator that the company is benefiting from its durable competitive advantage. A company can increase its retained earnings through its business operations or even through acquisition of other businesses. Warren himself would use his retained earnings to acquire other businesses to increase his retained earnings. But it has to keep buying companies that have a durable competitive advantage. And that, my friends, is how Warren has made his billions. Return on equity. A return on equity ratio is simply net income divided by total equity. When a company buys back its stock and retains the shares as treasury stock, it lowers the shareholders' equity but effectively increases the return on equity. So when a company reports a high return on equity, look for evidence of financial engineering, such as a presence of treasury stock, or if there really are excellent business economics. A companies with a durable competitive advantage have excellent return on equity ratios. And over time, this value is reflected through an increase in the company's stock price. So if you remember, we talked about return on total assets. One of the primary challenges with the return on total assets is that it mixes a levered measure of profitability with an unlevered measure of assets. Remember, assets can be financed with or without debt or leverage. And net income is sensitive to leverage because we can deduct interest expenses. Therefore, the return on total assets isn't the best ratio to use when comparing companies with significantly different levels of leverage or debt. Return on equity solves this challenge by factoring out the leverage in the denominator and calculates a return on simply the equity value of the firm. And this facilitates the analysis across companies, which you will be doing when you start investing with different levels of debt or leverage. So essentially, return on equity is a test of the management's efficiency in allocating the shareholder's money. There is a huge difference between the business that grows and requires a lot of capital to do so and the business that grows and doesn't require capital. The statement of cash flows. The final financial statement we'll talk about is the cash flow statement. And if you remember what we stated earlier, Warren believes cash is king, and maybe you believe it now too. You might be thinking, why on earth do we need to look at another financial statement? The income statement and balance sheet surely must cover everything, right? 
Well, actually, the cash flow statement provides insight that the income statement cannot because it tells us exactly how much cash a company generates and from what activity. Most companies use an accrual method of accounting. Accrual accounting is actually a very important concept in accounting and governs when a company records revenues and expenses. Revenue recognition through accrual basis of accounting dictates that revenues must be recorded when they are earned and when they are measurable. The matching principle and under this principle is that costs associated with making a product must be recorded during the same period as revenue generated from that product. So while accrual accounting has its benefits, it makes it difficult to track objectively the movement of cash via the income statement or the balance sheet. Hence, we have the, the cash flow statement. So the cash flow statement reconciles net income to a company's actual change in cash from the opening balance, which is what you started with, all the cash transactions, and then the closing cash balance, which is what you're left with over a period of time, such as a quarter or a year. The cash flow statement tells us exactly how much cash a company generates and from what activities. And the cash transactions are sorted by activity type, and they're broken down into three sections. Cash from operations, which is how much cash did the company generate from operations during that time period, or cash from investing activities, such as capital expenditures or asset sales and purchases, and cash from financing activities, which is, it could be new borrowings, paying down debt, issuing stock or share repurchases or issuing dividends. The total cash from operating activities. Net income is the starting point of the cash flow statement. Then we add back depreciation and amortization expense. Remember, those are non-cash non line items to arrive at the total cash from operating activities. Remember from part one, amortization and depreciation are indirect operating costs. This total cash from operating activities is considered the lifeblood of business after paying the necessary outgoings for financings and tax. Cash flows from investing section simply tracks what the company added or reduced with respect to their fixed assets and investments during that year. It corresponds primarily to the long-term asset side of the balance sheet. So let's give you some examples of this. Capital expenditures are a cash outflow. Capital expenditures are always listed as a negative number because this causes a depletion of cash. You spend and your cash is reduced. You might be thinking then, fine, I won't spend anything. But companies must invest in some form of PP&E to be able to build their products or services. Therefore, when you see a downward trend, it might actually indicate that, that the company on the whole is on a decline. So identify the necessary sustainable level of expenditures for the company that you're analyzing. Other cash flow items from investing can be acquiring a company that which is which would be a cash outflow, selling an asset, that would be a cash inflow, taking on debt, cash inflow, or buying back stock, cash outflow. Warren looks for companies that have low capital expenditures. Some companies must make heavy cash flow expenditures each year to stay in business, and companies with a durable competitive advantage have lower capital expenditures. Net income to capital expenditures. Warren reviews net income to capital expenditures using a simple ratio of net income divided by capital expenditures. He looks at the ratio trends over 10 years, but and not just one year. So a company using 25% or less for capital expenditures based on their net income or profit, the company then is likely to have a durable competitive advantage. You don't want a company that has to spend excessively to earn their profit. Basic shares outstanding. As we've already discussed, treasury stocks are shares that were once issued but subsequently repurchased by the company. Basic shares outstanding equals the total shares issued minus the treasury stock. Companies with a durable competitive advantage often repurchase stock instead of issuing dividends because shareholders pay tax on dividends. So this usually leads to a boost in the earnings per share, which is the repurchase of shares reduces the total shares outstanding, or to change the company's capital structure, which is more debt and less equity. So when a company repurchases shares, it either goes into the open market and buys them at the current share price or through negotiation with specific shareholders. Listen, do you think it's always a good idea for a CEO to buy back their shares? In what situations do you think that this might not be so responsible? Comment below. Treasury stock impact on shares outstanding. The basic shares outstanding equals total share issues minus the shares that were repurchased or the treasury stock. The basic earnings per share is net income divided by the basic weighted average of shares outstanding. A very common way that investors analyze company profits is by dividing net income by the shares outstanding. And hopefully you remember this from part one. And this metric is called the earnings per share. The earnings per share measures how much of the total current period profits belong to each shareholder. And Warren likes to see earnings per share increase. Basically, to find out if a company is buying back its shares, go to the cash flow statement and look under cash flows from investing and see if there's a line item in there that states retirement of stock. Cash flows from financing. Now that we've covered cash flows from operations and investing, we have to review the final one, which is cash flows from financing. This section of the cash flow statement tracks changes in the company's sources of debt and equity financing. So let's look at some common financing inflows and outflows. A payment of common and preferred dividends is a cash outflow. Common stock issued would be a cash inflow, repurchase stock, or a stock buyback would be a cash outflow and issuing debt would be a cash inflow. That's it. You made it to the end of this video. Pat yourself on the back for investing in yourself. 
I'm curious, what did you find most surprising about how Warren Buffett dissects the balance sheet or cash flow statement? Comment below and share with us. If you enjoy this con content, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on Twitter and visit our website. Let's build a girl investing community and become great investors. And in part three, we'll talk about equity bonds. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.